All right, well, if not, why don't you turn in your scriptures with me to Genesis 15. We're going to be continuing in our Bible survey as we survey the Bible. And we're, we're going through the book of Genesis right now. And we're really in the, the first stage of God's plan and program with the nation of Israel as he's just begin as he just called Abram out of the Ur of Chaldees, and he starts to uh, deal with him, we've been going over quite a few issues that really serve as issues of ed education to not only Abram, but as well as those throughout Israel's history. They can go back and look at how God dealt with their father Abram, and, or as he eventually turns his, changes his name to Abraham, and learn many things. And those are foundational things, they're fundamental things, and, but yet they're very vital and essential things uh, to, to understand God's fulfillment and plan and program with the nation of Israel. And we started to look at those things. We'll read here Genesis 15. Um, we'll start here in verse 7, and we'll read through the end of the chapter. We'll pray, and then we'll get into it. But uh, again, we're dealing with these essential things that really serve as the foundation of everything else that we're going to look at in the, in the Bible in, and through Israel's history uh, we're going to obviously take a look at some things in the dispensation of grace as well, and so there's things that don't uh, apply. But nevertheless, as far as the majority of the scriptures, uh, these are very fundamental issues that you need to understand and, and ought to understand in understanding Israel's program. So uh, Genesis 15, let's start here in verse 7. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the Ur of Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he, that's Abram, said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three, goat, three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying unto, thy seed, saying, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the, river of, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Uh, we'll, we'll just stop right there. He lists some of the nations there uh, that they're going to possess and take over. Uh, we'll just not read them because I'm not very good at pronouncing them. But before we get into our study this morning, why don't we, or this evening, why don't we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to look into your scriptures, to understand um, what your, your plan and purpose is for the nation of Israel. And although this isn't a part of our program, there's vital, essential issues that we need to understand in Israel's program for our own edification in this dispensation of grace. As one of the things that you explain to us in Ephesians chapter 1 is the dispensation of the fullness of times when you will gather together in one all things in heaven and on earth and gather them together in one in Christ Jesus. And the, the content and information there in Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1 is to generate in us thoughts about the dispensation of the fullness of times. And if we don't have a fundamental, at least a fundamental understanding of Israel's program, uh, then we are going to be uh, ignorant of, of the way and, and the manner in which you can gather together all things in Christ, besides just your sovereign ability and your great power to be able to do so, but to have some intelligence about those things, take some further study, and therefore you've provided us not only the information uh, in Paul's epistles for us in this dispensation of grace, but you've provided us a canon of scripture, the whole canon of scripture, to understand not only the plan and purpose you have with us in this dispensation of grace as members of the church, the body of Christ, 
but to understand Israel's program uh, through the prophetic scriptures and, and to understand in great detail what you're doing with them and what, what you have done with them in their history and what you, you will do with them in, in their future history. And so we thank you for being able to look at these things and may we esteem them to the, to the measure that we are to esteem them in this dispensation of grace, knowing full well that these things aren't directly applicable to us However, their, uh, their information that is still alive in the sense that it will come to fulfillment when the dispensation of grace ends through the rapture of the church, the body of Christ. So we thank you again for all these things. I thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Without him, we wouldn't be here. Without him, uh, we wouldn't care a hoot about who you are and, and what you've done uh, for us through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the, the renewing of our minds and the effectual working of your word in us, uh, even on a Thursday night as we look at these issues here in Israel's scriptures. Again, we thank you for this time that we can redeem it to your honor and glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Again, we've, uh, we've been dealing with some fundamental matters in uh, Genesis here. I always want to say Romans. In Genesis... And we looked at the kind of the first chapters of Genesis, which is really kind of a package of information. Genesis 1 through chapter 11, uh, God obviously creates uh, the universe there, the heaven and earth, and he, he creates a man, and, and we saw the usurpation of the adversary, and him gaining the monarchy of the earth, and uh, the, the, the battle between God and the adversary from chapter 4 to chapter 11, uh, culminating in that kingdom under Nimrod, who had a great city, uh, had a great kingdom. Uh, one of the reasons, again, why he was so great, because he was a mighty hunter. And that might be not a huge, uh, a big significance to us, but it is when, when the animals weren't afraid of, of man before uh, the flood, and after the flood, he put the fear of man in animals. And therefore, after the flood, when man would go around animals, they would flee from them. They would, and, and we see that today. You go and try to hunt deer, and they hear you, and get a sniff of you, and they run away, and you've got to hunt them now. Well, when that takes place, and, and Nimrod becomes a, not just a hunter, but a mighty hunter, uh, and, and, and not everyone is skilled in their hunt, hunting, uh, then you need to go find someone who is a good hunter. And you need to find someone who can get meat for you and food for you. And with that came along at that time great power and authority, and that's why Nimrod was so successful. That's why Nimrod had such a uh, successful in the sense of having many under him and, and having a do domineering influence over the whole entire earth. Well, that's the very location where God takes Abram, and, and that was an ungodly kingdom. Uh, there was abomination and idolatry being filled with in that part of, of, the land, of, of, the, of the land over there, Babel, Babylon. And God takes Abram out of that locale and sanctifies him, brings him unto himself, and starts dealing with him. And one of the very initial things that he tells Abram is, says, I'm going to make of thee a great nation. And therefore, Abram, coming from that area, understanding the great kingdom and the great city under Nimrod's uh, dominion and authority, has an understanding what that great nation concept is all about. That this great nation is going to have a domineering influence over the whole entire earth. And not only that, but through it, he's going to destroy the satanic plan of evil on this earth. And those are some fundamental things of God's plan and purpose with Israel. He is going to make them a great nation, have their influence reach the uttermost parts of the earth, and in it and through it destroy the satanic plan of evil that has been established in Genesis 3 through chapter 11. And what, you, what we see throughout Genesis 12 when God's dealing with Abram, uh, onward is these educational issues, these educational matters that uh, can really just pass you by if you're not keeping an eye out for them. Uh, we looked at Genesis 13, the, the, the gesture of possession that God told Abram once he got into the land there to walk up and down uh, to and fro in it. And that was a gesture of possession. That wasn't just looking at the land, how beautiful it was. But what that was doing was showing that that's the land that God was going to give him. That was going to be the land in which he was going to uh, utilize and formulate and, 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 and structure this great nation to do the things that he's planned and purpose to do with them. And therefore, just as uh, Job there, we saw the, the adversary, Satan, was walking up and down to and fro the earth as a, a flaunting in God's face of his possession of the earth. 
God had Abram go in that land and flaunt it in the face of the adversary to come along and say, this is the land that I'm going to give you. This is the land that I'm going to utilize. This is where I'm going to make you a great nation and establish my kingdom on this earth. And we took a look at, as well as the significance of the land, the land of Canaan. And Canaan being the, the, the seed by which the adversary is going to utilize to propagate his abominations. And after the, the judgment of the, the, under Nimrod there and the scattering of the nations all over the earth, the, the primary place of the, again, the propagation of his abominations was the land of Canaan. Great abominations were going on there. Uh, and we saw the, the nativity of that land and the nativity of that people, the Amorite and the Hittite, and the, and the human sacrifices and the, just the wickedness and ungodliness that was taking place there. And, the, and what God's doing is he's bringing the battle of the repossession of the earth right to him. And, and not only that, but he's going to wait, as we just read in Genesis 15, he's going to wait until the, the, the iniquity of the Amorites is full. Meaning, and when they're at their full strength, that's when he's going to bring them. That's why they go into a, the, the land of Egypt and they're there for 400 uh, years because the, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full and we'll eventually see once they come out of it, that's when the, uh, the, the iniquity of Amorites is full and they're in their full strength and God's bringing it to them. And the things that he does in Egypt will eventually deal with. And how the fear of his name and the fear of the Lord was, was declared throughout all the nations surrounding Egypt. It, it, it just spread over the whole entire earth. And especially that land of Canaan, the very land that he's headed towards. Well, again, those fundamental matters are being dealt with right here. We dealt with Genesis 14 with the issue of Melchizedek and the, and the battle of the kings there that was taking place. And, and how Abram wasn't involved until, his, uh, until Lot was carried away as he was under uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah there. And, and one escapes that battle and comes and tells Abram that very issue that Lot has been uh, taken captive. And Abram goes out there with 318 men. 300, a, a little remnant, a small band of, of, of people. And they go out there and slaughter them. And what all that's educating Israel and Abram and his seed about is when God's going to fulfill his plan and program with them. There's going to be a small remnant. The Lord comes along during the gospel accounts and calls them the little flock. And, and the Lord's going to return on this earth and there's going to be a small group of believers at that time, the true Israel. And they're, they're going to have opportunity to finish the vanquishing of his enemies. And they're going to be able to go into the uh, in certain nations and, and, and war with the, not, with, not against the Lord, but war with the Lord against his enemies. And not only that, but after that, they're going to get the spoils of victory, just like there were spoils of victory in Genesis 14, that Abram said, no, I'm not going to take any of these. And the Lord then comes along and says, I am thy exceeding great reward. I, don't take these spoils. That, those aren't the real spoils of victory. Those real spoils are going to be out here. And we saw passages, Isaiah 60, Isaiah 61, Isaiah 62 there, the, that package of, of chapters there in Isaiah, talking about this time when there's going to be darkness and judgment and the Lord's going to return and then the spoils of victory are going to flow onto that kingdom that he's going to bring down with him and establish on this earth. And you have Genesis 14 sitting there as an educational issue and a foreshadowing and a, and a type and a figure type issue of what's to come as God's going to fulfill his plan and purpose with, with Israel. And then the, one of the last issues that, again, I wanted to deal with before we move on and deal with some things regarding Jacob was this passage here in Genesis 15. Again, in Genesis 15, we start dealing with here, specifically in verse 8, this question that Abram raises to God. He says, and he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I, sh uh, shall, I, know that I shall inherit it? He wants to know, how, how, will, how do I know that I'm going to inherit this land? Show me. And there's, a, there's just a, a fascinating and, and kind of uh, awe-striking issue that, that takes place with these animals. And we started to see the significance of those animals. Five animals that come along in the, in the first three, uh, he divides. The birds, he doesn't divide. And we saw here, and I have it up on our uh, timeline here, those five issues, are, the fulfillment is going to take place through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to redeem them. He's going to be their redeemer. 
He's going to be their deliverer, their, their avenger, and their king and their blesser. And there's, there's five major issues that God has to constantly educate Israel in. That's why there's five books of the Psalms. The seven Jehovah compound names can be uh, knocked down into five major issues. We'll eventually deal with all those things, as well as the, the seven feast days. All those things can, can go down into five issues, five major issues of what God needs to be for Israel that they can't be for themselves. And the one I love is that there's that she-goat there. And the, and the she-goat, that's the issue of being a deliverer. And all throughout the scriptures, when God talks, uh, a majority of the time when he talks about deliverance, he talks about as a, a woman travailing and, and, and get, delivering the, the child. And, and, and I think it's fascinating that he just, it's not just a goat, but a she-goat. And the first three are divided. The redeemer, the deliverer, avenger, but the last two aren't divided. And there's a, there's a what are they there? Turtle dove. Dove is, a, is, a, is a, a symbol of peace and a young pigeon. Not just an old pigeon or a pigeon, but a young pigeon. They're going to have a youthfulness in that kingdom. As they're going to get resurrected bodies and they're going to, they're going to get eternal life and they're going to have the dew of their youth. And that, all those things are representative of the way in which the, the things that Abram, as he goes through those things, the way that Abram's seed is going to have to go through those things as well in order to inherit the land. They're going to have to get the redemption. They're going to have to get the deliverance. They're going to have to get the avengement They're to partake of the king and the, and the blesser, and, and the king and his kingdom. They've got to go through all those things. And again, this is a, a way of educating Abram about the, the matters that are yet ahead to come. And ultimately, this remnant, and, and even the remnant throughout time in Israel's history can look back on. When, when God's dealing with Abram as a father, a father is the issue of he's begetting something, he's starting something, he's authoring something. And when you do that, there's great detail and emphasis put upon it. And, and, and these matters are those, those issues. And we also took a look at the issue here of verse 12. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be in a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. Those two verses provide, excuse me, provide an outline of what's to come in, in Israel's history that we'll deal with here in a, in a second. But notice verse 15. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Abram understands that he's not going to live to see this day as far as in, in, in his first lifetime, if I can describe it that way. But rather, he's going to be resurrected into this. And therefore, Israel's history is, gonna, is going to proceed on without him. And so that's one of the ways in which he learns about the, the, the resurrection that later on he has an understanding when he goes to offer his only begotten son, Isaac. He understands the issue of resurrection already. But then verse 17, And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. There's going to be darkness out here before that, deliver, before that kingdom gets established. They're going to have to go through some dark times, not only in Egypt, that 400 years, but eventually out here there's going to be darkness and there's going to one who comes as a smoking furnace. It's, it, it, that's the Lord Jesus Christ who's going to come with the, with the fire and power of his word and, and, and all those issues that we, we started to take a look at. I want to wrap that up and then eventually come back and look at verses 13 and 14 and, and then move on. But again, we were dealing with this time period as we did take a look at that smoking furnace issue and in a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. There's a... That, that in, in, in a manner that's describing the, the wrath of God and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's some times involved during that time. Um, come look with me 
get Acts chapter, well, before we go there, come with me to Psalm, Psalm 18. I might, I might switch it on you. Yeah, get Psalm 18. Let's look at some of these verses here. Because this smoking furnace issue in, in a burning lamp is descriptive, again, of how the Lord is going to return on this earth. And those are the things that need to transpire in order for Abram and his seed to whereby inherit the land. And, and they're going to pass through the animals representative of the redemption, the, the deliverance, and the avengement. And then there's going to be that, that darkness there type issue. And then after that's going to come the, the kingdom and the, the blessing, as it were. I'll look at Psalm 18. Look at verse 1. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from, from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. All this is, is, is prophesying about a, a couple issues. One being the, the, the cross work of Christ. The enemies compassing him and, and the, his enemies being around him and all, this, all these issues. But it's also typical of this remnant out here in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord's wrath. He goes on. Uh, let's just jump down to verse 7. Then the earth shook and trembled. The, founds, the foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was what? Wroth. He's talking about the, the wrath, and that's what the Lord took on that cross, the wrath, the, his, God's wrathness, his wrath. And, and that's the thing that they're going to be facing out there in this day. He goes on there in verse 8, There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, remember that smoking furnace issue back there, and fire out of his mouth devoured, and coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds. He, and then verse 12, at the brightness that was before him, his, his thick clouds passed hailstones and coals of fire. All that's descriptive of when he's coming through the heavens and the heavens bow down and, and there's, all, it's just darkness. It's just, I mean, you look at the universe, I mean, you look at the heaven, it's, it's dark up there. Now you talk about some alterations to the sun and moon, and as far as visible light on this earth that will have, it's going to be shortened. It's just, it's going to be dark. That's how he describes it. It's going to be gross darkness, and then he, and when he comes, there's the bright, and that's why he's talking about that issue there of, he made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark water. It's not like he's getting into any type of darkness himself. It's just darkness is there. It's, it's been judgment on the earth. It's been judgment in the heavens. And he's coming down and he's making that his place. And then verse 12, at the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. His wrath is coming. Those hailstones talk about, in Job 38, he talks about, when he, his creation, he has storehouses of hail up there that he made in preparation and time for the day of battle. He created those things, understanding some things that were going to transpire. And those hail still, I mean, you want to see hail. You won't see hail until that day. I always tell people, everyone thinks, oh, the, the, the day of the Lord is taking place now. There's earthquakes and famines and, and wars and rumors of wars. I said... First of all, we're not going to be there. If you're a believer, you're not going to be there. But second of all, hey, you're going to know those earthquakes. There are going to be earthquakes like you've never, you think a 7.2 or whatever. I don't know what the biggest earthquake is. You can study it out yourself and let me know. But you think that's something? Just wait. Just wait when he, when he looses the bands of Orion and, and that, that hold the place in earth and he shakes that thing. And, 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 and he talks about the, the waters and, and they're roaring. He's going to loose the thing. It's just going to... And you, ever, you take a cup, a glass of water and, and shook it and just spilling over. That's an earthquake. That's a shaking of the earth. That's not one of these 
and I don't want to minimize because I know it can cause great uh, horrific things in, in, in the places that these earthquakes take place, no doubt, but it's nothing compared to that day. And so you'll know in, in those hailstones, you'll know those hailstones, they'll know those hailstones. That's a judgment of God. And, and guess what they'll probably label it? Global warming. Global warming. No, it's God's judgment. But anyway, all those things are the things that are coming ahead. But uh, come with me to uh, come with me to Acts three now. All this this time period, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's wrath, and then the establishment of His kingdom, the things that are going to be taking place. Uh, they end up getting a description. They kind of uh, terms that define. All, the things that are going to, like, kind of a, a title to define all the things that are going to take place at this time and this time. And Peter talks about them as he's right here. Uh, I mean, he's, he's right there, Acts 3. I mean, if you take out the dispensation and grace in view, there, you know, there's a year of mercy and forbearance, and then the day of the Lord. So he's coming along and describing some of these things. Acts chapter 3, look at verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And he says, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Well, that involves the presence of the Lord. That's when he's gonna, his presence is going to be here. Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, and, 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 and Zechariah 8 there talked about when they'll be out there and, and the Gentiles will grab a hold of a skirt of a Jew because God's with you. Those type issues. This is called the times of refreshing. And then he goes on, verse 20, and he, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Uh, these issues are prophetic. That's, that's what we're looking at right now, in a sense. Uh, with Abram back there in Genesis, we're looking at the issue of the, the times of restitution. We already know through Abram and this great nation issue that he's through this great nation he's going to destroy this satanic plan of evil on this earth. And therefore, there's good, in connection with that, you come along and read Genesis 15 and you have a smoking furnace and darkness issue and, and horror of great darkness. All these things is going, to be through the, is going to be the instrumentality in which he destroys the satanic plan of evil on this earth and judges the earth. And now you come along later on, they've all been prophesied about. He's just now coming along and saying there are times of refreshing and times of restitution. The Lord ascended, uh, the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. Until his enemies be made his footstool. That took place when the stoning of Stephen, he looks up, the Lord Jesus Christ is standing. He was sitting until his enemies were made his footstool. Now he's standing and he's going to be, be that man of war, just like Joshua was. And, and, and David, and have victory over his enemies. And that's what he was going to commence. His day, the day of the Lord, the day of vengeance. All those things were about to transpire. And the, I guess a way I want you to think about right now is as if uh, they were, they're called the times of restitution. Well, what is, what is restitution? Restoring. A restoring? A payback. That's, that's, that's perfect. It's the, it's the act of making good or of giving an equivalent for any loss, damage, or injury. All those things from the foundation of the world that are ungodly and unrighteous and have offended the holiness of God that he hasn't poured out his wrath upon. He, he, he made judgments on Egypt and things like that, but as far as overall, he's held back. He's long-suffered. For, he forbear all those things. And there's a day when he's going to pay it all back. He's going to pay it back. He's going to restitute. He's going he's to give an equivalent for any loss, damage, or injury. To him and to, his, and, and to his saints, he's going to pay back. Uh, in fact, hold your hand here. Come with me to Romans 13. We're, we're taught about this in our dispensation. Romans 13, verse 1. 
Romans 13. You think God was long-suffering and forbearing back there. Well, now thousands of years have passed by in this dispensation of grace. His long-suffering has been uh, to a, a level and a measurement beyond comprehension, almost. And his forbearance is so great. And he comes along and he, he does some teaching regarding this issue, regarding the issue of justice here in Romans 13. <clears throat> Look what he says in verse 17. He says, recompense... I'm sorry, I say Romans 13, I meant Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 17. Re recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Your enemies persecute you, things are done wrongly to you. Things are done wrong by our, uh, from our government towards you and all these things. Give place under wrath, for it is written. Why? Why? Why in the world do you give place under wrath? Why in the world do you let someone evilly entreat you? Why in the world do you let your enemies persecute you and not retaliate? One, because God's long-suffering and forbearing it today. But second, what he's going to say, For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Vengeance isn't ours, it's his. He will repay, and he'll repay way better than you could ever. And therefore, he comes along and makes a conclusion in verse 20, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. You, you, you want to appeal to any, and, and, and make his, his head soft, and, and get him to think about things. If there's any honesty of heart, in him by this good work of God's grace that you're showing to your enemy just maybe just maybe he'll hear the gospel out and be saved be not overcome of evil but overcome evil of good with good folks there's a lot of Christians that need to hear that there's a lot of grace believers that need to hear that that's that's a a, a dispensation of grace commandment of the Apostle Paul one that is only generated by understanding, look, he's not pouring out his vengeance today. Why are you? He's not wrathful today. Why are you? What is he doing, though? He's operating his goodness. His long-suffering is forbear, his grace. And he is feeding those that are hungry. And, 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 and. Anyways, I'm getting off, off track there, but... What I want you to see in connection with that is the, his, his, his vengeance where he's going to repay the equivalent of the things that of, of any loss or damage or injury towards him or his saints, he's going to take care of out in that day. And those are the times of restitution. But then he, he talked about before that, he talked about the, with the presence of the Lord, the times of refreshing. What's, what's involved in the issue of refreshing? Restoration. Restoring. Restoring. Yep. When you think about, I know you guys are probably tired. It's, you know, almost, wow, it's almost 8 o'clock already. Holy smokes. But when you think about refreshment, you know, it's an it's a interesting word. When, when are you usually refreshed? When you wake up, okay. Yeah. And what are you doing when, before you wake up? You are what? Sleeping. Yeah, and, and, and there's times when, I mean, you think about Gatorade, right? Gatorade is, is it's a, a refreshment, or a soda, or a pop, a water. It's all a refreshment. And one of the reasons why it's a refreshment, because of your, of your thirst. And, and you usually get a thirst because of, of some type of fatigue or exercise you're doing or some a strenuous work that, that's taking place and you need a refreshment. You need something to, to satisfy that thirst and refresh you and give you a capacity to, to go on and do some things. And what's going to be taking place here is the time of restitution. Great judgments are going to take place. And there's great uh, fatigue in, in, involved in that, in, in a sense. And then he's going to come and refresh things. He's going to restore them. And, that, and that's what we talked about in, in connection with the garden. And we saw passages there, I believe it was, I don't remember off the top of my head, I think we looked at Isaiah, uh, I don't remember, it's Isaiah 50-something, I think, where it talked about the, 
refreshing, he doesn't use that terminology, but how there's going to be waste places and desolations because of the law of contract they're going to contract for. And he's going to refresh, he's going to change their waste places to the, the issue of Eden again, back here. He, and he's going to make their deserts like the garden, like back here. He's going to refresh things. And there's a lot more that goes into refreshing than just the land. You're talking about the satanic policy of evil in the course of this world. He's going to, in his times, the times of refreshing, that's why you have a thousand years there, he's going to slowly take away the things that were established that we looked at in Genesis 3 through 11. And he's going to break those things down and and refresh those things and, and get things out of there and, re, and restore them to the way it has. And the, and the earth, if you look at the earth through all that, has gone through a great time of bondage and corruption. And now there's going to take place a refreshing. Refreshing is relief after fatigue and suffering. A, that's a dictionary, a good dictionary type definition. I want to I want to move on here, um, but again, this smoking furnace issue, and the day of the Lord. When you come along later in Israel's program, you start to see those things, what they are, the time of the times of restitution of all things, the time of restitution of all things. Man, that's gonna that's gonna be that is gonna be hell on earth. People think that it's now. And then the times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. And those are the issues that you're starting to look, we're starting to see there back there in Genesis 15 as he goes through. You have the redemption taking place at his first coming, the second coming, deliverance, avengement that are a part of the times of restitution. And then you have the, the times of refreshing, the issue of his king and, and blessing. And, and that's why Abram's going through those divided animals there. He's, he's going to go through that, and then there's that smoking furnace type issue, and after that, there's going to be a refreshment, the, the, the turtle dove and the young pigeon. A refreshing, you're, you're in old age, they're going to, their age is going to change, the, the issue to their body is all going to change. The lion laying down with the lamb, and, and, the, and the child laying down at the lion, all those type issues back there in the prophets are going to take place out here in those times of refreshing. Well, you're, again, you're starting to learn that fundamentally in Genesis 15, and even, and even really before that, and in this part as God deals with a, uh, Abram because that's his plan and purpose with him. His plan and purpose is to make him a great nation, establish his kingdom with him, and destroy the satanic plan of evil through him, through this great nation. And, at, and therefore, when he begets it and he starts it with Abram, it's just necessary and natural to describe these issues with Abram as the father of this nation and the father of many nations that he's going to become. Come back with me now to Genesis 15. Genesis 15, and I want to finally deal with this outline. Because uh, these things to me are, at least are significant, you know, especially when you're in the Old Testament as we know it, I got to be careful as I use the Old Testament, as we've been dealing with the Old and New Testaments on, on Sundays. Um, the Old Testament, as far as thinking about it, the way I'm talking about it right now is Genesis through Malachi. As I've been dealing with it on Sundays, I've been talking about it in the sense of the, the operation that it is, the, the system of operation, the education that it is, uh, which is different than Genesis through Malachi and uh, Matthew through Revelation. Uh, that's not how I'm talking about it. But... Here I am. I'm, as far as the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, uh, it's important to understand where you are and what you are to expect um, and what's going on. And you, and you kind of need a, a guide to bring you through. And there's certain things you come across, like Genesis 15, that provide that guidance for you so you know what's to, what you're to expect, what's to come. Uh, because part of that is God's given it to His people so that they know what's to come. Uh, in fact... This passage right here is what Moses' parents operated upon. A timeline to understand when God was going to bring Israel out of Egypt. They had an understanding and a rough timeline 
of that by Genesis 15. Look at Genesis 15 again. Look at verse 13. Genesis 15, verse 13. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Moses was born right around that time to be able to be their deliverer. And his parents knew it because they were faithful. They understood the times they were in. They had a guide by this verse about the 400-year time schedule. But what you have there is an expectation now of what's to come in Israel's history. You, we know now that know of a surety. This is, this is going to happen, that thy seed, Abram's seed after him, shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. Now we know that. But these things guide you through that. We know that takes place with Joseph. Joseph is the one that goes down in, into Egypt and eventually everyone comes into Egypt and then there, uh, a, a, a Pharaoh is raised up that, who, who knew not Joseph and starts evil and treating them. And starts doing what the rest of that verse says. And shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. There's, they're going to be afflicted. That's, that's an important issue because they're going to be, my understanding, they're going to be in the land longer than that because you're going to go over to Moses and see the issue of 430 years. But the affliction aspect of it is going to take place 400 years. And then, verse 14, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. So they're going to be in that land for 400 years. They're going to be afflicted, but then God's going to judge that nation. Well, we know that. God, he goes in there with Moses and, and gives those judgments, gives those plagues, those ten plagues there. But this is, in, this is helping us of the things there to, uh, to come in Israel's history. I will judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. Then they're going to come out with, with great substance. Again, that's an outline. That's an outline of the first half of, of Exodus there. If I can erase this. You have the, the issue there in Genesis 15, verse 13. The issue of strange land and, and, and afflict. We'll see that in Exodus 1, verse 4 and 5. And then the, the issue in Genesis 15 and verse 14, the, the, the judgment, I'll just put judge, and I'll just, put, uh, I'll just put great substance, coming out with great substance. That's going to take place in Exodus 2, 1 through 15, verse 21. And by the time you get to that portion, they're out of the land. They're on the other side of Egypt, or other side of the Red Sea, ready to go on the precipice of entering into that land. And some things transpire that we're going to have to look at. But it's giving you an outline of, of Exodus. Genesis 15, 13 is fulfilled in Exodus 1, really chapter 1. And then Exodus 15, 14, the judgment and the, and the great substance takes place in Exodus 2, starts in Exodus 2, 1 through 15, verse 21. Come with me and look at that real quick. Come with me to Exodus chapter 1. We'll just take a look at the strange land issue and affliction. They're, they're in the land already, but look at the affliction taking place. Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, look at verse 5, we'll start here in verse 5, I, mean, I, I said Exodus 1, 4 and 5, I didn't, that's, that's wrong, just bear with me here, 
Look at verse 5, though, of Exodus 1. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died and all his brethren in all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. That's one of the, one of the ways they come out with great substance. They come out with physical prosperity as well. But one of the issues is God was going to multiply their seed in this strange land. Verse 8, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the, ch the, people, of ch the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they set, did set over them taskmasters to what? Afflict them with their burdens. So really, I mean, I should change this. I don't know why I had verses 4 and 5 there. You had the, the issue there of, of, of 10 and 11. The, the, the affliction. They're in Egypt already, and now you start to see the, the, that affliction. Um, look at verse 13. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. They're going to go down and serve them. Now they're adding to that servants a, a rigor and afflictions to it. And you're starting again see, hey, well, I already know this is going to take place by Genesis 15, verse 13, and, 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 and so on. I want to do one last thing before we end tonight. <clears throat> Give me five minutes. Let me see if I put it up on the slide. I don't know if I did. No, I didn't. Um, I want to provide the outline for the book of Exodus. We're going to deal with one more issue in Genesis. We're going to deal with the issue of Jacob and see some things in connection with Jacob. But then we're going to move on to the second stage in Israel's program, the Exodus stage, when, when God does all these things. And I just want to provide you the outline for these things, if you want to read them. Maybe not. Maybe you're like, I'm not going to ever read my Old Testament. But you should. The first part of, of Exodus is Exodus 1, verse 1 through 22, what we just looked at there, what I already had up here. And that's the fulfillment, again, of Genesis 15 and verse 13. The multiplying takes place. The afflictions take place. Verses 1 through 7, the, the multiplying takes place. Verse 8 through 22, the afflictions. Second part of Exodus, these, these books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomies, Deuteronomy, sorry, has four major sections to it. So we'll be outlining it in, in four sections. It is 2 verse 1 through 15 in verse 21, and again, and you have the fulfillment again of Genesis 15 and verse 14. He's going to judge them, judge that strange, uh, strange nation, and he's going to bring them out with great substance. Um, also, in there, you get the historical details of the raising up of Moses as Israel's deliverance. There's an issue that we're going to eventually deal with under this one. The, the name of Jehovah that has great amount of significance to it that we need to have an understanding, not only in Israel's program, but the, this, this name and what this represents, ultimately Christ is going to be the mechanical means to put that into effect. We need to understand that. Uh, you can't get far in Romans. Romans chapter 1, it talks about that, that they, Paul has received the grace and apostleship for the obedience of faith among all nations for his name. And that's, that's this issue. For his name. There's an the issue of his name doing something for him. And then there's, some, there's the issue of responding to that for his name. And so we'll learn about, we'll learn about that. The third section is Exodus 15.22 through 1827 and you have God's education 
to Israel in his, I'm just going to abbreviate, Jehovahness and grace. And what's involved there, they go through five trials after they come across, on the, uh, they're on the other side of the Red Sea. Instead of going straight to the land, he doesn't. Instead, he brings them through five trials to prove them and test them and educate them about this name. That's why it's significant to understand. And, and his grace, him doing for them that which they can't do for themselves. And they don't get the education. They don't get this education and they don't understand some things when he brings them out of the land. Because if they did learn it, then when he came along and provided that contract, that old covenant, they would have never have accepted it. And you may have heard us say that before, that Israel should never have accepted that law contract, but in order to substantiate that claim, you need to understand this. And, and the five trials that they go through and see the validity that God was educating, before, educating them before that and that they should have never accepted that law contract. They should have said, no, Father, God, you need to do it. Just like you've been doing everything else for us up until this point, you need to do it for us. And so we'll see that. That's going to be a big portion that we'll look at as well as we get into the second stage in Israel's history. And then the last issue there is Exodus 19, 1 through 40, verse 38. And that's the issue of Israel. This is the, the law issue. Israel contracting. To be dealt with. Dealt with by works. And that's the issue of that law. That takes up the rest of the book of Exodus. You get the details of the contract of works. You get the tenor of the law, the ordinances, the performing. Uh, it, it, there's going to be issue in here. Leviticus 26. The, bless, the contracted blessings and curses of that law based upon their performance. And that's going, to be a, that's going to be our next major outline, as it were, to what's to come in Israel's history. Um, we're going to see that they're going to get the curses. And those curses have their, their courses. They, they have a start, and then God, if they don't obey that law, then he'll bring the course of punishment against them. There's five of them. We'll see it. It's just perfectly laid out for you in Leviticus 26. And he'll start that first one, and then he'll kind of he'll, he'll put it on hold, and then he'll give them a time to get things going again, a time to change their mind and connect with who they are and who God is and their capacity to, and their failure to keep this law contract. But if they don't, then that first course will get back going again, and he'll add to it the second course. And then he'll give them a time after that. And then if they don't repent after that one, then he'll bring out, he'll, he'll continue the first and second, and add to it the third, and so on, until you get to the fifth. And the fifth one is the majority of, is, uh, majority of the detail regarding Israel's history, the, from Babylon to the establishment of that kingdom, is the fifth course of punishment. So you have all the major prophets all the way up until Revelation, don't include the dispensation of grace, that they're under the fifth course of punishment. And, and so we'll eventually take a look at all those things, but that's where we're headed. This is, the, again, the second stage in Israel's history, coming out of the, the strange land that they're going to go under and be afflicted of. Uh, come out of that, and, and they're going to be educated by God before God can utilize them in that land. They need to be made spiritually fit. If they're going to dwell in that land forever, they need to have perfect justification, perfect sanctification, but they don't learn the lesson that God needs to do that for them. And instead, they, they say, we can do this all by our works. And so they still go into the land, but they're not going to fulfill God's plan and purpose with them because, it's by their, by, because they're under that Old Testament. They're under that law contract. So again, that's where we're, that's where we're headed Next lesson, we'll deal with Jacob, and then we'll start dealing with the, the book of Exodus and some things regarding in that. And there's some fascinating detail in there uh, regarding God's name, Jehovah. I am that I am.
and the, the second form of it, I am. And, and you wonder, well, wait a minute, he said, I am that I am. Now he said, I am, what does that mean? And, and, and there's two issues in, in connection with his name, Jehovah. I am that I am, his, his timelessness. And it's perfectly taught in a perfect, timely manner, because they've been in Egypt for 400 years, been afflicted of a strange nation, and there's a question, even by Moses himself, who comes along and says, God, are you really going to do what you said you were going to do? Because for 400 years, that was 1613 in our day. A lot has taken place in 400 years. And there's the anticipation and understanding that they might be thinking, is God really, really going to say what he said he was going to do back, back in the day? And God says, you need to know me by my name, by the, the Lord God, capital o, L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Jehovah. I am that I am. I'm timeless. I don't look at time and I don't view time the way you do. It, it's just like yesterday to me. And I could still get my plan and purpose done. And therefore, he has a certainty of counsel. There's immutability with him. And then the issue of I am. And it's kind of like, he, you got I am, that I am. And then you come along and says I am, and it's kind of like a blank. And the issue is, I am whatever you need me to be for you. And that's where the Jehovah compound names come in. Jehovah Rafeka, Jehovah Jireh. I am thy, I am thy, thy healer. I am thy sacrifice. I am the things that you need me to be for you. I know what you need me to be for you, and I will be those things. And the, 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 his unlimited capacity in his name. And um, that's a vital issue because every time you come across that capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that name, and the reference back to my name, I will do it by my name, and, 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 and my name is at stake in all these issues is those, those two things are behind it. And he's always referencing back to it because that's what he wants them to understand in connection with who he is. So those, again, are things uh, ahead to come that are just beautiful and wonderful issues. Not even looking so much at Israel's program, but just looking at who God is. Uh, those are things that we can, as they were written aforetime, were written for our learning, and we can learn great, great detail uh, about God in them. So... Um, Let's finish up there and, and, and pray. Father, we thank you for, for this time to look at your word and look at these, these final matters in Genesis as we got one more as we deal with Jacob and the significance of Jacob and what was going on at that time and the, the passing down of the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant to, to Isaac and then to Jacob. And through Jacob was the, the, the formation of the structure of the nation going to take place. And, and through Jacob and, and his, his seed Joseph there going to go down into that strange land that, that, and that strange nation that was going to afflict them for 400 years. And after that, you were going to judge and, and come out with great substance. And all the... the the sequential events that lead up to that uh, are going to take place in the rest of Genesis. And so we don't have to go through them in much detail, but we'll look at the Jacob there. And so, Father, we thank you that we can go back and understand these things and, and understand them not in a, <clears throat> in a vain manner, but understand the wisdom that you have in connection with these things and understand your pr prophetic purpose with the nation of Israel and, and to see of how you're going to utilize them to reconcile the earth back to yourself through Christ becoming their redeemer, their deliverer, their avenger, their king, and their blesser, the representation of those five animals that Abram went through, whereby they're going to inherit that land. And although they're going to go through a time of great darkness and a, and a, and a horror of great darkness because of what you are for Israel and the believing remnant of Israel, they will come out and become that great nation and have that kingdom established in that land and have its influence reach the uttermost parts of the earth. So we thank you that we can understand these things and, and see the power and the capacity and the wisdom to get it accomplished and, and, and therefore have a, a, a comprehension and at the outset of our dispensation of the power, wisdom, and capacity to get what you want to get done in this dispensation of grace that we are part of as members of the body of Christ to reconcile the heavenly places back unto yourself. We thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice on that cross for the debt and penalty of our sins.
I do pray if anyone's listening, they have not trusted Christ as their all-sufficient Savior, how they died for their sins, was buried and rose again, that they have believed this very moment. And, and once they do, God will justify them. He'll forgive them all their sins, past, present, and future, impute his righteousness unto them, and therefore they will have the gift of eternal life as a present possession. May, may they believe this very moment. We thank you for this time of grace given as well. We don't give grudgingly or on necessity, but willfully and cheerfully according to the effectual working of your word in us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.